welcome back to His and Hers History. My name is Steph. And my name's Aaron. And we are your hosts for today, as always. We are back with our second episode ever. Yeah. How exciting. Very exciting. How's your week been since we last recorded? It's been good. I've been getting over my um, addiction to saying the word okay, which we found out in the first episode. Good news. Um, that I say that a lot. <laughs> and the tone I use is not very pleasant as well. It's a bit, um, a bit too informal. But I'm looking forward to seeing what your... Uh, little ticks might be. We'll just have to wait and see. <laughs> we have not tested that out yet, so we'll have to look. We'll have to wait and see. <laughs> now, are you excited for this week's episode? I am, because at the end of uh, the first episode, you left me a little clue and Dude. you said that there was a pan fight and tents involved or mm-hmm. something like that. And immediately I said, it reminded me of Brokeback Mountain, and I don't know why. There are some sort of similarities, yeah. but well, you'll have to see. So without further ado, today's title is called Human Hovel and the Great Pan Fights. Great Pan Fight, it sounds amazing. Now, a human hovel, I might be, no, a little bit about, are they Australian explorers? They are Australian explorers and it should be taught in Australian schools. However, I missed out on that. The I don't only, know how the it happened. Reason, the only reason I think, I thought they might be explorers is because there is a, a road called the Hume Highway which goes over a stretch yes. of uh, Victorian Australia. Good pickup. It is, yeah. And um, I assume that, that it's named that because he might have travelled or explored that area. Well, you will find out. Mm. Well, I guess Australian history isn't taught as well as it should, so these are probably two characters that we should know a lot about, but unfortunately mm. we don't. I might start with Hamilton Hume and a little breakdown about who he is. Hamilton Hume was born the eldest son of Andrew Hamilton Hume and Elizabeth Kennedy in 1797. I love this quote, which was written in 1966, and it's just so of its time. She was an accomplished woman of equitable nature. Elizabeth was a perfect foil for her her unpredictable husband and gave her four children, particularly Hamilton, the rudiments of a sound education. So... Basically, he was pretty much self-educated by his mother. Um, he was born in Australia and one of the first people to be born in Australia. Oh, wow. However, it did say her husband was unpredictable, which is a big under-exaggeration because he did have can I Can I just make an assumption that maybe he's a drunk or something like drunk that? Drunk and a rapist. Oh, my goodness. Apparently. <laughs> um, so not he comes from good stock then, basically. Yeah, that's right. So in 1812, when Hume was around 15, Hume and his family moved to a 100-acre property in Appen. Nice. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but I'm going to give it a go. So this gave him ample opportunity to investigate the local countryside, and he tailored his skills as a bushman. And by most accounts, he was, and he had a mostly civil to positive relationship with the First Nations people, which, if you know anything about that area at the time, it was definitely not the case. Yeah, they yeah. There's some it negative quite a large story, massacre. Yeah, yeah. negative yeah. stories about that. Might get to that in one other episode. Yeah, but maybe. We'll see. So after honing in his skills, Hume made his first exploration at 17 with his brother John and an indigenous man, which I couldn't find the life of me find the name of, but I did try. Together they explored the Burmima Bong Bong district. Well where, done. Well done. Bravo. I don't know if I did that right. <laughs> Sounded right to me. <laughs> where Hume put his bushman skills to use. Later on, he made two journeys to the same area and together with a man named Charles Thornsbury and James Mahan explored the country of Argyle. This exploration tracked the course of, oh, here's another one, the Molesbury River. Oh, Molesbury and, River, yeah. Yeah, this led into an, another expedition that led into Jarvis Bay. So he really expanded. So was he just doing this off his own bat? He's like 17. He's like, I'm just going to go exploring. Pretty much. He was. And I assume these areas. He had a passion for it. I assume these areas are unmapped. He's just going in there to explore them because no one's been there. Yep. So he and his brother sort of had a passion for it. I know. He was later accompanied by George Barber and W.H. Broughton, who explored and found the Yas Plains. Yas Queen. Yas. Yes. (laughs) No, I don't know where the Yas Plains are. Obviously my favourite place. So you'll see it on the way to Melbourne to oh, Sydney. Oh, yes, yes. Yes. I'm familiar And you with can't that. say you're Australian without passing Yas on the highway and not looking up some local businesses. Or, just like you did, going Yas Queen. Yas Queen. <laughs> Every business just sounds so hyped when you're on the way. Yeah, like, Yas McDonald's. <laughs> Yas 9 to 10. 
I do want to show you a post if you'll open up your phone. I'd like to share with you a local bit of news from Yas from May 6, 2021. Um, so you can see in the article I've sent you, IGA Yas has yes. had a competition. Uh, they had a competition to win 10 kilograms of a Cadbury block, which is our chocolate in Australia. Um, can you have a look at the hashtag that they might have used for their competition? <laughs> I'm scrolling through. Just look up the top at the photo. <laughs> oh, hashtag I G A I G A Y A S S I G A Y A S S I G A Y A S. I'm assuming that's supposed to say. Yeah, I think it is. And if you do want to read more, you can definitely have a look at some. Funny things that's, people that's do with the hashtag. <laughs> bit unfortunate, but you know, it's a bit of fun with Australian town names. <laughs> All right, so obviously, I don't think I can top that story now, but I will try in the rest of this podcast. So, there is still some strange left in this episode. Well, there's a pan flight, so I mean, <laughs> yes, that's right. It's going to escalate. <laughs> <laughs> so, in 1822, so we're skipping ahead a little bit here, Lieutenant Johnson. Alexander Berry and Hume reached the Clyde River. So they've done lots and lots of exploration here. And Berry was actually one of the people who introduced Hume to his more well-known partner. And this partner, you may recognise from the title, is Captain William Hovell. Hovell, yeah, I've heard of the name Hovell, mm-hmm. I think. So if we think of Hume as our self-made bushman, then we can think of Hovell as the English equivalent. William Hilton Hovell was born in Yarmouth in the seaside town of Norfolk in England in 1786. So he's a little bit older than Hume. Being so close to the ocean, Hovell fell into his profession on the sea. According to the Sydney Morning Herald, Hovell started his career at the age of 10. Ooh, he beat out, his, he beat out Hume. That's right. <laughs> Five years ahead of him. So this coming as a result of his father's own ship being captured by the French and his father being imprisoned. Wow. So after excursions to foreign places such as Peru and Rio de Janeiro, Hovell quickly became a captain at the tender age of 22. Spoiled. (laughs) I can't imagine it was the most luxurious life back in the 1700s. Probably not, yeah. I just heard the word Peru and stuff and I thought, oh, he gets to travel. I'm thinking that in a modern day (laughs) sort of thinking, oh, he gets to go to another country, but it was probably hard work and very scary. However, at this time, Hovell had a desire to do something different. It was his dream to settle in wild lands that he'd explored, one that was full of adventure, perhaps a land like our new colonies in Australia. So he got the travel bug, basically. He did. He just wanted to go and explore, you know. He was wild at heart. Yeah, a bit spoiled, (laughs) just wanted to get out on his own. What makes you think he's spoiled? I don't know. I'm just going at the angle that, like, the Australian Hume was, like, this tough, rugged kid and he, you know, he found his own way. I suppose this hovel guy did as well, but mm. because he's British. They probably had very similar lives. So, in 1810, he married Esther Arndell. Esther Arndell was the daughter of a prominent surgeon in New South Wales, Australia. Can I just interrupt there? Mm-hmm. If you're an explorer, is, do you think it's a good idea to get married, like... You're going to go out on big adventures. You're going to be away for a long period of time and potentially die. Probably not a good idea to get married. Coming from like a female perspective of those times, that might have been preferable. Uh, yeah, potentially, yeah. Hamilton Hume's father wasn't a great role model. Yeah, that's true. But also, <laughs> what was the paycheck like for an explorer? Like, okay, you have to go and explore this stuff. If you come back alive, yeah, we'll pay you. Funny but, enough, um, I do go into that a bit later. Okay, looking forward to it. <laughs> So his new father-in-law had practiced as a surgeon in the new colonies and retired to Parramatta. It was his father-in-law who convinced Hovell to move to Australia. It did help that his new father-in-law, Andel himself, was an explorer and had been involved in lots of discoveries, including the Nepean River. And this encouraged Hovell to immigrate, believing that Australia was a land just waiting to be recorded and discovered. So like exploring runs in the family. It does. It sort of sounds like anyone could have been an explorer yeah. back in those days. Although it would have been the biggest flex in the world. It's like, yeah, what do you do? Oh, yeah, I'm an explorer. Yeah. <laughs> Map parts of Australia. Yeah, it's pretty cool. They were like the first local celebrities. Yeah, they would be. Imagine that. Imagine knowing someone that just, yeah, I just discovered like half this state. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be pretty amazing. 
1813, Hovell had prepared his recommendation from the colonial office that he was a worthy settler and started the trip to Australia. Of course, he had prepared 500 pounds worth of trade goods. So he's spoiled. Told you. (laughs) Sorry. That was his job. He has to prepare something. Spoiled. Shortly after arriving, Hovell became involved with a man called Simon Lord. Or Simeon Lord. I'm not sure how that's pronounced. Let's go with Simeon. That sounds way better. (laughs) It's pretty good, isn't it? Lord was an ex-convict who had against all odds created quite a reputable lifestyle for himself and had developed a mostly clean reputation. It was Lord who opened a contract with Hovell to join him on his 1814 trade route to New Zealand. Oh, did he make a deal with an ex-convict? Like He did. Mm, not a good idea. <laughs> he, he was an interesting man. He had friends in really high places and friends in really low places, which sort of put him in the middle of the He's a man of the people. He I was. Eh. <laughs> Maybe not. You'll see. Yeah, okay. Hovell captained a ship that was joined by another ship. And this ship's captain happened to be Maori. Hint, he was also transporting the same sort of goods as Hovell. After the two ships had unloaded their goods, a skirmish broke up between, bro- broke out between Hovell and the other captain. And this was about a pay dispute. Hovell said that he was taking some of the goods because he had safely directed the ship to New Zealand. Arrogant. Although they had done exactly the same job and spent over a month unloading all the goods each. Of course, this made our Mary captain quite upset and a skirmish broke out between Hovel and himself. So I was I was onto something with this mm-hmm. Hovel. Like he's spoiled and he's like, hey, I've done the exact same work as you, but I want to get paid more. Exactly. I, I was right. I, yeah. I had an inkling. I was right. And I do say this is, of course, pretty standard for an 18th century white guy. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> Privilege. Privilege for days. So this led into a fight and a fight that would leave casualties on both sides. Oh, so not just a punch on like... It was it. They went on. Yes. They went in. Yep. That's right. So according to official records, five Europeans died compared to 60 Maori bodies on the ship. Um, yes. So they were like using muskets and stuff, I suppose. Correct. And the other guys were just yep. going in there with their hands. Probably. It was not a fair fight. That, that sounds like the shortest war in history, episode <laughs> one of his and Her's history. <laughs> so although Maori accounts do believe it was more. So painting a sort of picture of who Hover was and his beliefs. Before heading off, because of course they did, the crews destroyed local visit villages before leaving. As as white guys from the 18th century did, you just, hey, we, we've just killed 60 of your men. Why not burn down your village as well? So I thought that was an important thing to analyse because Hovel is quite celebrated for in Australian history for his exploration yeah, I have, duties. I've heard he's like, like semi-popular. Yeah, so I thought I would just highlight that little bit of history. So maybe this event was a catalyst for the next few years of misfortunes that Hovell would face. Bit of karma. In 1816, he captained a ship that was shipwrecked and driven ashore during the daylight, which Lol. is quite rare, <laughs> on the Bass Strait, and stranded there for 10 weeks. In 1824, he was indicted for insulting an officer on the, in the administration of justice, which was wrongly reported in the newspapers as an assault and battery on that same person. To be honest, he sounds like he his father should have been Hume's father because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> he sounds impulsive and reckless and arrogant. So this incorrect news report did put a bit of a black mark on his name. Oh, okay, finally. Nevertheless, he was still made to pay a fine of five pounds. Oh, no. <laughs> Woe is me. In the same year, Hovell was accused of being accessory to carrying away stones from a quarry. His accomplices were both found guilty. However, Hovell faced a different jury and was found not guilty. See? Because of course he was. Spoiled. Yeah, he's just (laughs) got got connections and stuff like that. Everyone took the fall for him. He's not not coming out as a good character. And I didn't want to paint him that way, but all my research... You didn't need to. These are are stone-cold facts about him, so... So we do have two men. One, the older Hovell, who was seen as the wise explorer by the people. Um, However, from records that we have of him and to modern eyes, wise maybe is not the name we would grant him. I would, I don't know, that's probably not how I'd describe him. I'd describe him as maybe um, wayward, perhaps. Interesting. Is the term I would Wayward is quite fitting for what we will. (laughs) 
And then we have the younger Hume, the bushman with grand dreams of exploring Australia. I like this Hume character, you know, <laughs> self-made, came from, you know, his father wasn't nice. This is actually why I chose this. I thought Aaron would enjoy the character. I do tend Hume. to do we that. I self-made I people. sort of, you know, build uh, characters for the stories. You do. So in 1824, the two men began their journey after being introduced, as I had originally said. Hume had originally planned to fund the trip himself, so they were making their way down. <laughs> However, so he's a good guy. He's a good <laughs> the guy. budget blew out, and Hovel, was, who was 11 years Hume senior, accompanied uh, him. So he's like, and he put the rest in, of the bill. Yeah, he came to say that it's all right, mate. I'll, I'll sort you out. Pretty much. Arrogant. <laughs> the explorers signed an agreement with the government, who supplied them with the bare essentials, including a tent and some access to firearms and frying pans. Well, we will find out. Ooh. Let's not forget the other explorers that joined them on their adventure. Hovel went into great detail about the equipment and supplies he brought along. However, he did not seem to appear to think that the other men that joined him deserved the same treatment. This is a running theme <laughs> with this guy. He's he's so privileged and up his own ass. He thinks he's the best. I hope I hope he gets hit with a frying pan. I hope that's what happens. <laughs> we will find out. Luckily, we have a good record of Hugh, who Hume decided to bring along as a result of his journals. He chose men that had experience in the bush and working in remote locations, which makes a lot of good sense. Good choice, yeah, yeah, if you're going out in the Australian bush. One of these explorers was named James Fitzpatrick. He was a political prisoner from Ireland who was originally transported for seven years. He was convicted of attacking a house with firearms. Thought you might like this one too. Yeah. <laughs> he was what I would call a... Ace. A, a scallywag, scallywag. that's nice. what I wrote. Yeah, good choice. A bit of a rogue, <laughs> a rebel. He also escaped early into his sentence but was captured shortly after. He jumped at the opportunity to go along with Hume. He was chosen because he was seen as more intelligent compared to his other convict counterparts. However, not because of his practical skills, he was not known as a strong swimmer or bushman. So uh, not really sure why he came along, but... Because he's good with at the guns? brains. <laughs> This is my favourite one. Another convict on Hume's agenda was named Henry Angel, who was more lovingly known as Harry. He was seen as burly and a stocky handler of livestock. He was born in the south of England in 1790, and he'd worked on farms since he was a young boy and was experienced in dealing with horses and bulls. There's an interesting story about Harry that historians have debated, however, mostly have come to the conclusion that it was plausible. Let me guess he wasn't an angel. Not really, I'm no. just doing a play of his, his uh, surname there. <laughs> I don't know. You might have made the same choice if you were in his shoes. Back in England, a man by the name of Henry Witt, a baker with a small farm, had entrusted Harry to grow a crop of potatoes, and Harry was promised a share of the profits. However, Sounds he reasonable. agreed to this with no written contract, which later mm. in life he would say was a bit silly. So like a handshake deal sort of Pretty thing. much. Yeah. After the crop had been grown and harvested... Harry was told that he would meet Wit in the local inn to get his payment. However, when Wit met him there at the inn, he showed him all the money that he'd got from his crop, bought a round of beer and simply left. So he g- <laughs> gave him nothing? Pretty much. Harry, oh, of course, Hang on, hang on. If I was this Harry guy, yeah. I'd totally go and rob him and or destroy the crops. <laughs> just saying. That's Have what you I'd read do. my script? No, no, I'm just saying <laughs> this is what I think I would do in that situation. Harry, of course, wanting his payment, followed Wit home, tackled him to the ground yep. and took the money he was owed. Wit then for charged him with robbery on the King's Highway and he was found guilty and sentenced with transportation for life, which, of course, led him to Australia. Well, in those circumstances, I don't blame him. I, in, I'd probably do the same thing, I would have thought, mm-hmm. like in that time, but... If he gets sent to Australia, I suppose he gets to explore. So Yeah. Lastly, Hume employed Claude Bossua, who was a pugilist. So he's good with his hands, a boxer. He is. Yeah. So Claude was a boxer who, like boxers today, can come off as quite overconfident. However, if Harry Angel's accounts are to be believed, this may have all just been bravado, as at some point in the trip, he said he'd rather go on, he'd rather than go on, Claude laid in the ground and sobbed. Rather than press on in the exploration. Yes. Right. So, so at this point, he's, they've taken with them Hume, as mm-hmm. written. He's taken with him an ex-Irish convict that's supposedly quite smart, but not a good bushman. He's taken with him this 
Henry bloke, mm-hmm. Harry, who, yep. Harry, sorry, um, who is like a farm hand basically that's been done for robbery. Yep. And he's taken on this boxer that's a bit of a soft, pretty much soft fella. Yep. We and also no, have... just interestingly, no bush experience amongst the three of them. We have Hume. Interesting. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you said earlier that he um, was involved with the indigenous people. Perhaps maybe asking one of them to come along and help may have been a good idea. May have been. Yeah. Hovel did make a very short mention of three people that came along with him. So we have oh, Thomas no- Boyd, nice who was a servant. There's also records that Thomas Boyd was a servant of Hume's father, so they may have had a connection there. Remember that name. William Bollard and Thomas Smith. Thomas Smith apparently did nothing of substance as he was never mentioned in Hume or Hovel's journal and never mentioned again after. Poor well, guy. <laughs> ma- hey, maybe he's the smartest one. By the way, this is going. This is Maybe he's the smartest one of the lot. Eh, uh, considering I think a lot of them made a little bit of money off telling okay. their story. So. But... Also, were these guys that he bought along with him, were they his mates, pretty much? It sort of sounds like they were mates. Uh, I don't believe so. Or acquaintances. It seems like they were chosen because of some certain skills that they had. But, like, boxing? Not not necessary in the <laughs> hey, bush. Hey, you never know who you're going to run into. Rob- robbing kangaroo? people? Maybe. Oh, you <laughs> could, could get into a punch on with a kangaroo, but you're right. All right. So, as I mentioned, Hovel didn't make much of an- account of the people that he went on with but he definitely did of the equipment that they brought along so that shows you where his values are. he valued the equipment that was with him rather than the men Correct. he chose to take on the <laughs> expedition interesting so the equipment for the expedition consisted of some of the following seven pack saddles one riding saddle eight stands of arms six pounds of gunpowder 60 round of ball cartridge six suits of slops i have no idea what that is Six blankets for the men. One tent, which is interesting. What? Well, I assume that's for him, yeah. <laughs> 1,200 pounds of flour, which they had to ground themselves. 350 pounds of pork. 175 pounds of sugar. 38 pounds of tea and coffee. Eight pounds of tobacco for the men. 16 pounds of soap. 20 pounds of salt. And of course a pan, because he can't go into the bush without something to cook on. That's right. The Sounds tent, like the biggest yeah. picnic, like the biggest <laughs> wildest picnic ever. The tent of which human hovel would share. This would mean that the tent mm. would be a very important piece of, of equipment for the two men. Brokeback Mountain, I called it. <laughs> Almost impossible to go on an exploration without one. Do you agree? I mean, you'd need a tent, but how about one for each man? Yeah. If he's like that rich, surely he could spare... Drop some of the other stuff that he's brought along and just bring a couple more tents. Well, of course, the tent's only essential for the leaders, human hovel. The rest of the men would just rough it in the open. Oh, yeah, I suppose they're boxers and stuff, so they're tough. On paper, human hovel's union should have been perfect. An ideal mix of the knowledgeable bush expert and the experienced navigator, because, of course, hovel was a captain. Hume providing the local knowledge and survival expertise, which I'm sure you will agree you will need in spades, especially in Australia. Mm. And Hovel, who had an accomplished knowledge of navigational skills, mainly longitude and latitude, of which the mainly formally uneducated Hume did not possess. So Hume sort of needed him in that way. They sort of needed each other. By the Pretty much. Of, yeah. So it sounds like a match made in heaven, it does. surely. It does, yeah. Unfortunately not. From the beginning, the two men regarded each other as rivals. Now, please remember from here, Hume and Hovel had no idea what they were traveling into. They had never traveled this far before. We now know the extreme differences between terrains, the wild rivers, the mountain terrains, is between New South Wales and Victoria. You'll experience wild bush with thick undergrowth. I can only imagine the challenges they would have faced on their 16 week journey. 16 weeks is a long Mm -hmm. time to be sharing a tent with someone you consider your (laughs) rival. (laughs) That's a long time. You couldn't do it? No, I would last maybe a day and I'd probably (laughs) cave their head in with a frying pan too. Oh my. The expedition started on the 2nd of October, 1824 from Hume's hometown. The first day was spent getting the stock familiar with their harnesses. They crossed the Neopian River which I can imagine would have been very difficult endeavour for Claude, of course, the one who couldn't swim. I was about to say, why didn't they cross a bridge, but there wouldn't have been bridges back then. (laughs) They were mapping the area, so there could be bridges in the... 
Twelve days into their trip, they reached the known most remote point settled westward by colonists. So no colonists had gone further than this at this point. Oh, so 12 days in and they haven't even actually explored anything. They've just travelled to the destination where they can start exploring. Correct. (laughs) Wow. On the 15th of October, they were finally leaving any remnants of European civilization. They had planned to be joined by an Aboriginal guide from this point. Ah, finally, a bit of local knowledge. He would support them through a large chunk of their journey. However, he didn't arrive. And they made the decision to continue on without him. Um, smart choice probably by that man not yes. to turn up because yep. they sound like they've got no clue what they're doing and horrible decision by them to press on. I Correct. Thought. That is what I thought too. On the same week, they reached the banks of the Yass River and had climbed up multiple Yass hills. <laughs> they eventually reached trouble on the 19th of October when they reached tough terrain to cross and high waters that they were unable to cross. But they can all swim, yeah? Incorrect. Oh, is it? Claude? We don't trust Claude. No, yes, he can't swim. After hours of waiting, the river height refused to lower and Hume decided to MacGyver a canoe out of a box tree. A badass move. Very cool. He's won some points there. However, Um, it failed. It was uh, the incorrect (laughs) time of year and the sap didn't hold the Well, at least like he's trying to draw on some of his knowledge that he's learnt. And he is a go get him sort of guy. He's not going to give up. Yeah, that's right. Hovel probably stood there and was like, you're an idiot, don't do Pretty it. Pretty much. So Hume once again MacGyvered a punt as a, using a tarp. So a punt sort of like something you'll bring across a river. So he took the wheels off the cart and secured the tarp to the cart. Mm-hmm. And luckily there was a stronger swimmer than Claude on the trip, who was Thomas Boyle, who was one of Hovel's accomplices. Oh, fine. He actually got someone that could do something. Yes. So he literally took the rope in his teeth and swam across the river. Keep in mind, this is freezing cold river because it's coming from the mountains at this time of year. Again, badass move. (laughs) That's pretty cool, I'll be honest. He is celebrated for that, which is nice. On the 23rd of October, the two men reached a valley. It was unclear which way to travel as there were many paths. However, they all looked equally as dangerous. At this time, the group set up camp. Hovel and an accomplice had spotted an emu and the hunting dogs had chased it down. Oh, they had hunting dogs as they well? They did. There That's wasn't cool. enough meat for them to take, so they did need to take some hunting dogs with them. I wonder what emu tastes like, whether it's... Well, Hovel wanted to find out because he chased the dogs down with his accomplice. However, because of course he did, Hovel and his partner got lost in the wilderness. But he's an intrepid explorer. <laughs> he knows longitude and latitude. Surely he, he can find his way back. Nevertheless, they weren't able to find their way home. Fluke. They had to spend a I'm night sorry, hungry, cold, and without shelter or safety. At this time, Hume was busy finding a safer path through. So Hume was pretty much doing all the work. Yeah. While Hovel was out just chasing an emu. Yeah, chasing his dogs, chasing an <laughs> emu. Hume was eventually able to track down Hovel, whose sense of adventure and desire to take off on his own seemed to have dampened after this event. Mm. Apparently, he stuck very, very close to the group for a long time after this event. Smart idea. <laughs> However, that is of course. Until in early November, Hovel and Hume had reached the Snowy Mountains and the Great Frying Pan Battle officially begun. This sounds awesome. I can't wait. (laughs) The whole party was in awe of the beauty of the mountain range, calling it an immensely high mountain covered nearly one-fourth of the way down with snow, and the sun shining upon it gave it the most brilliant appearance. It was one continuous range of the highest mountains I'd seen in any part of the colony. So if you have any idea about the Snowy Mountains, it is very big and very widespread. Mm. So Hovel looked at this range and wrongly estimated the highest part of the range to be about 20 miles up. However, he was incorrect as the ranges are much, much higher than that. His desire was actually to climb the ranges. Yeah, of course. With everything. Hume was convinced that they were heading too much in an easterly direction and that they needed to change direction to go round the mountain range to avoid getting trapped. He thought that as if they followed Hovel's direction, they would get trapped and wouldn't return. Mm. He'd pretty much die on the mission. Well, this, this, is, this is a guy who ran off by himself chasing an Indian <laughs> yeah. and got lost, so I probably wouldn't trust his directions. Hovel, of course, a sailor in the past, could only envision a straightforward trip. That's what I was going to say before. When you said he was an experienced explorer, I was like, he's only ever been at sea, yeah? He's got nothing, no knowledge of inland Australia. The men ultimately decided to split up. 
Oh God. And and here's where things go severely downhill, I would imagine. Correct. This is of course meant provisions would be divided equally. And by equally I mean equally. So remember when I mentioned all the provisions the men had brought with them? Mm-hmm. Well, they all had to be split up. The horses, they each got one. The carts, they had to split those up. The flour, yep, split. But hang on. How did I mention there was only one tenth? Mm, who gets yes, the tenth? one tenth that the two men shared throughout this trek. Well, in an unsurprising turn of events for those two men, they literally split the tent in the middle. Yes, they cut the tent in half. Oh. I'm a bit surprised by that. I thought well, one of them would that just... that was the agreement until the more level-headed Hume decided to just let Hovel have it, have it, deciding that it would be a futile action to cut it in half. This, now, you know I love a hero and a villain. This Hume guy is sounding like, you know, he's rational, mm-hmm. you know, he's he's um, well thought out, and you know, he shares the supplies, and this Hovel bloke just sounds like, I'm the man, I'm the best, I should take everything. That was the assumption I got too. Yeah. But where does the Battle of the Pan come in, I hear you ask? Mm. Well, it so happens there were, that there was but one pan on the trip. The two men, of course, both thought that they were entitled to the pan. So, in one last childish action, the two fully grown adults explored, explorers held each side of the pan and pulled as they tried to claim it as their own. Can you imagine the other guys watching on there? They'd just be like, what is going on here? Funnily what enough, I did read it? lots and lots of accounts of their... Oh, each one of their accounts. It's quite funny. (laughs) So I do wonder what it would have looked like. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, two (laughs) grown men fighting over a fry pan. It it would look funny. So with each man clawing each side of the pan, as expected, the pan snapped in half and the two men parted ways, each with a half of a pan. Which wouldn't be good good for cooking anything, I wouldn't imagine. I don't think so. No. I can't even imagine that their pride was very much intact after yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> and to be fair, if they snapped the pan frying pan in half, it mustn't have been much of a frying pan to begin with. That's correct. At least it was something, though. Yeah, that's it. So Hovel was headed straight for the snowy mountains and Hume was finding a safe alternative westerly. Did they take their three men or did they split the men up? They like, did. So, like, Hume took his three... And Hovel took his three. Correct. Yeah. So here's an excerpt from Thomas Boyd's account. So he was part of Hovel's crew. His gang. Mr. Hume and Mr. Hovel had a great difference about the course they should go. After quarrelling over it, they parted, each going his own way. I had to go with Mr. Hovel. After travelling some distance... He sounds upset about <laughs> <yeah>. that. <laughs> I represented to him that the course we were steering led us right among the snowy mountains and that if we once got among them, we could never get out and must all be lost. He agreed with me. Finally, some sort of sense. So he's like, act of the tough guy, and he's got a little bit away, and he's sort of looked over his shoulder and gone, guys, I don't know what's happening <laughs> yeah. here. Maybe we should go back. And at his desire, I sought and found Mr. Hume's track, ran it down, and we joined him and his party about dusk the same evening, just as we, they had camped for the night. So luckily, Thomas had some sort of... He managed Smart to convince him. him yeah. <laughs> Could you imagine the interaction when Hovel got back there? Hume would be like, what are you doing here? <laughs> Nothing. I just thought I'd come back with you. I can just imagine when they had to split off with their H, either Hume or Hovel. Yeah. He would not want to be going with yeah, Hovel. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Hovel's like, I was bored anyway, so I just came back. <laughs> From here, the exploration continued until they reached Corio Bay. Or Corio, sorry. According to Hovel's journey, many modern calculations predict that the men actually made it to modern-day Port Phillip. There are enough similarities between Corio Bay and Port Phillip and Western Port for this to be a valid mistake. However, it was a mistake that likely delayed the development of the city of Melbourne. Oh, wow, really? So, according to accounts, and they're not exactly proven, um, Hovel was convinced that they didn't make it to Port Phillip. He was convinced they only made it to around Geelong area. However, Hume believed that they had made it to Port Phillip. So if he had sort of trusted his guts and been a bit more adamant about where they were. That could have started the construction of the building of... Wow, there you go. After the trek, Hume and Hovel were each rewarded with grants of 1,200 acres. When Hovel returned, he lived a pretty unsubstantial life. He remarried and started multiple endeavours, which never really took off. When Hume returned, he married Elizabeth, who was second daughter of John and Hannah Dyte of Richmond. So in 1927, the government offered a grant 
um, and other indulgences for anyone who could find a road over the Blue Mountains, of which um, Hume was successful in. Uh, he was also attached to Darling and Child Sturt's expedition. Have you heard of that one? Vaguely, yes, yes. I'm aware of that. Um, this is where they reach the Darling River. And I guess Hume lived a pretty attractive life after that. He became pretty a pretty successful. famous explorer. Hovel tried to ride off the fame, but I guess people could see through his charade. Yeah, maybe it finally got to a point where they realised that this guy isn't, you know, as good as he mm-hmm. what he thinks he is. So on that trip to the Darling River, Hume actually found explorers that he enjoyed compared to Hovel. He actually found lifelong friends in... Charles Stewart, which is a bit more than he can say for Hovel. So he actually found <laughs> like some experienced explorers that he could work with and you Correct. Know, Maybe not fight over a pen. Yeah, that's right. Maybe <laughs> they weren't um so arrogant as to think that they were the ones in charge at all times. Yeah. Correct. And I guess Hume's legacy that he leaves behind, um, to most accounts he had a positive relationship with Aboriginal people in the area. It sounds like that from earlier in the story when mm. you said he sort of interacted with the Indigenous people. Yeah. 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 So, he, so he sort of sounds like he might have been an okay I think he would have liked sort of guy. Him. Hovel, on the other hand, <laughs> not so much. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, he sounds like, yeah. Well, I hope you enjoyed that, Aaron. I did. I did enjoy it. I hope it. you learnt a little bit. I did. I enjoyed the... Uh, the story of the, the two men and their difference in personalities. And I find it so absurd that these two <laughs> distinguished explorers were fighting over a pen in the middle of Australia. Yeah, that's right. And <laughs> I find it um, a bit strange that that the explorers, that they the people they took with them were not skilled in any way, shape or form in <laughs> exploring the Australian outback, but hey... Maybe, I don't know, they had some other skills that they used. One of them could swim. I do believe some of them did become explorers after that. Oh, so they, they took it on. They thought, wow, they did, we were yeah. super successful. It has nothing to do with <laughs> anything we did, but we're going to take yeah. it on. Yeah, that was really good. I enjoyed that. Thank you. And if you would like to hear some more stories about history told from his and her perspective, please subscribe. Yeah, if you'd like to follow us, give us a like, um, comment, anything you'd like. You can find us on Anywhere you can find good podcasts, Spotify, um, Google. Uh, what else have we got there? We've got YouTube now. YouTube, if that's more <laughs> your speed, do a like or comment, anything you'd like. Um, any feedback is welcome. So thanks. Bye. Catch ya.